but very few of them are suited to surviving in a life after humans. The smallest dogs probably won't last a week without us. There's probably no niche for the smaller dogs. Dogs are very competitive, and when you have wolves, they displace coyotes, coyotes displace foxes, and we would assume that hierarchy would prevail among domestic dogs. In fact, many of the unique features that have been bred into dogs over the years will now become major handicaps in the fight for survival. Your dogs with the really short legs, I think of the dogs with the really short faces or long faces, uh, I think that they're all doomed. And you know, they're not going to move well, they're not going to be able to search and explore. I think that the kind of the middle of the spectrum, the kind of average dog, has the best chances of this. I think that they will survive in the long haul, but it's not going to be pretty. As the surviving dogs struggle to find their new niche, household pests are slowly beginning to notice our absence. Those ubiquitous little creatures, rats and house mice, that would seem to be able to exist without us, are surprisingly quite dependent on our food supplies. Rats and mice are usually termed commensal rodents, which means that term means literally sharing the table. They are very dependent on people. And the little house mouse and the Norway rat, great examples of animals that would do less well in the absence of people. In the initial weeks after people are gone, they will raid pantries and homes and grocery shelves in stores. After eating through these food supplies, they will struggle to survive on things like cardboard, cloth, or glue. I think that if a city was abandoned, the rats would have to go back to earning an honest living. And an honest living means to go back to the wild and uh, and compete for resources there. Eventually, these rodents will abandon homes and buildings, which will make them easy pickings for predators. Although rats and mice will most likely survive in the future, their numbers will be greatly diminished. After six months into a life after people, urban areas are already taking a turn for the wild. Predators would return very quickly in the absence of humans because we suppress them. We create conditions that either work against them or we, we deliberately go out and, and remove and destroy them. They would come back very quickly. Smaller predators, like coyotes and bobcats, always survived on the fringe of human populations. They are the first to colonize our abandoned neighborhoods. Larger carnivores will have to wait longer for the habitat to recover enough to support their appetites. But soon enough, they too will hunt in what were once our backyards. One year into a life after people. Towns and cities are still recognizable, but nature is beginning to reclaim her old turf. One of the first great physical effects in the absence of people would be the transition of the impervious surfaces, the parking lots, the roads, into places that supported and then had an abundance of plant life. Any place where you have sunlight that's hitting, you're probably going to get some plant growth. Little seeds are going to get stuck in the cracks and so forth, and these things are all going to start to creep. Plants are wonderful that way. They can destroy things in, in matters of, you know, a few years.
Without humans to remove them, weeds like dandelions infiltrate every crack in the pavement. As these weeds die, their remnants combine with ever-spreading moss and lichen to create a layer of topsoil. This sandy soil is poor in nutrients, so only plants like clover that can pull nitrogen from the air flourish at first. Formerly manicured yards morph into fields where white-tailed deer forage for food. Wild animals have also begun to find their way into abandoned cities. Man's supposed domination over nature has proven to be quite tenuous. The signs of our vulnerability have always been there. This is an Alanthus tree. It seems to enjoy rooting itself in very inhospitable locations, and it likes to attach itself to crevices in buildings. And when it does so, it causes damage. The roots expand, and the expansive forces of that force out mortar and stone and cause crumbling of a facade. If you get a lot of this on an entire building facade, it could cause major, major damage. As nature battles back, even man-made goliaths like Hoover Dam aren't invincible. To harness the power of this river took 21,000 men and five years of hard labor. But one year after people, its 17 massive and seemingly indestructible generators are about to be brought down by an organism the size of a human thumbnail. The lake above the dam is infested with an invasive species of mollusk called the quagga mussel. This stealthy invader from Eastern Europe had no natural predators in North America other than the humans tasked with scraping it from the grates and pipes it colonizes. The mussels attach themselves to the inside wall of pipes and they're very prolific. They colonize and rapidly build up and can grow on top of each other and eventually completely block the diameter of a pipe. The small pipes that bring cooling water to Hoover Dam's generators make perfect homes for these creatures. And with no people around to remove them, they can spread like a cancer. And in fact, those muscles could clog up the cooling water pipes to the point where we couldn't keep these generators cool anymore. And it would cause a high temperature alarm in the automatic control system. And that automatic control system would then start the shutdown sequence of that generator. Well, that would happen one by one to all of the generators at Hoover Dam, and eventually the entire power plant would be shut down. In Las Vegas, the last glimmers of man-made light on Earth relinquish the night to its primeval blackness. With the generators no longer running, no water at all is passing through Hoover Dam. And the Colorado River downstream begins to run dry. On the other side of the dam, the water has nowhere to go, and Lake Mead starts to rise. It would just keep building up in Lake Mead, and it would eventually get to the point of spilling over through the spillways on either side of the dam. 